As you can see, today is our fourth and, and final week in this sermon series titled Passion, which is a series that has focused on the passion that Jesus has for you and me. Uh, for the past three weeks, some of you have perhaps learned for the first time, and some of you have been reminded for the hundredth time that you are one of the ones that Jesus is passionate about. That is, if you are a believer. You see, Jesus is passionate about his bride. He is passionate about his church. He is passionate about each and every one of his followers, his disciples. So if you are one of those, you need to know that Jesus is passionate about you. And Jesus' passion is fueled by love. He is passionately in love with you. On Resurrection Sunday, I reminded you about Jesus' greatest act of love. I reminded you about what Jesus' love for you led him to do for you. Jesus is so passionately in love with you that he gave up his life to save your life. He died so that you could live. He willingly hung on that old wooden cross. He willingly was tortured and killed to save us from our sins, to reconcile us to God, to give us a new life. He died for us so that we could be born again. We also learn that uh, before Jesus was able to die for us, he first had to humble himself. And he did that by emptying himself. He laid aside some of his divine privileges and then he put on humanity. He left heaven and he came to earth, remaining fully God while also becoming fully man. And he did that because he is passionate about us. He loves us with a very humble love. He humbled himself so that he could die for us. But he did not come to earth and humble himself just to die on the cross. He also humbled himself to show us, to demonstrate for us how to live a humbled life. And what exactly is a humbled life? It is a life that is lived in love and obedience to God. Being humble means yielding, surrendering, and obeying God. Jesus showed us what humble love looks like. And then last week, we learned that the love that Jesus has for us is the greatest love. It is perfect love. The perfect Jesus loves us perfectly. And last week, I shared with you kind of four ways that we can measure this perfect love that Jesus has for us. And in doing so, we can just begin to comprehend just how perfect and magnificent and the magnitude of his love for us. So we learned about, first of all, the degree to which we do not deserve to be loved. Then we learned about the, the greatest uh, or the greatness of the price that Jesus paid to love us. Then we learned about the, the greatness of the good that is done for us because we are loved by Jesus. And last but not least, we learned about the level of passion that Jesus has for those he loves. So by looking at these four things, we were able to see just how great and perfect Jesus' love for us is. Church, for three weeks, you have heard about the, the passion of Jesus. You have learned just how passionate he is about you. You have heard time and time again that he loves you. But I want to ask you this. Have you ever stopped and just thought about how many people, entities, and things tried to stop Jesus and his love for you? Have you ever thought about all the things in Jesus' life on here on earth that tried to stop Jesus' greatest act of love for happening? Have you ever thought about just how many people tried to stop Jesus' life and his ministry and his death and his resurrection? You see, when Jesus walked this earth, some people wanted him dead because they thought his words were blasphemous. Others wanted him dead because they were concerned that he would disrupt their own interests and their own rule and their own power. While well, some wanted him dead because they, frankly, did not want to see mankind saved. Some misguided people even, though, even thought that they knew better than Jesus. And they tried to prevent him from dying on the cross by protecting him in an act of, of love. But today I want to share with you 
One more amazing truth about the passion that Jesus has for you and me. I want to talk about one more aspect of Jesus' love for us, and that is this. It is unstoppable. Jesus' love for you and me is unstoppable. And that's hard to believe, right? Because in a world where anyone can lose at any time, where every one of us fails a lot, where everyone faces defeat from now, every now and then, where every living thing, no matter how strong and how powerful, it eventually fades and loses power and loses its luster and eventually dies with time. You need to know that Jesus' love, Jesus' passion is unstoppable. Jesus will never lose. His love will never fail. He will never face defeat. His power and love will never fade or diminish and it cannot die. Jesus Christ is unstoppable. His love for you is simply unstoppable. Well, today I want to share with you those people, those entities, those uh, that tried to stop Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, but they failed so miserably because Jesus' love cannot be stopped. Now, and I want to share with you these people who opposed Jesus, who tried to stop him, with the, the, the encouragement to you that uh, those people or those things, those types of people are still around. And they will still try to discourage you and still try to stop you. But by seeing how Jesus defeated them in the past, you can be assured that he's going to defeat them in the present and that he's going to defeat them in the future. And there's nothing that's going to stop him. All right? So we're going to go kind of chronologically um, through Jesus' birth to his death. And we're going to be looking at the ones who opposed him the very most. Okay? There was a whole bunch of them, but these five stood above the rest to try to stop his love and action. So first of all, we have this, King Herod. King Herod, the paranoid politician, all right? Now, King Herod, if you didn't know, was the king of Judea at the time of Jesus' birth. And like many kings, like many governors, like many politicians before and after him, and even today, he liked being in charge. He liked his power, he liked his position, and he wanted to keep that spot at all costs. And history tells us that he did just that. He was a very ruthless man, a man who executed anyone he viewed as a threat to his throne. And yes, that even included a lot of sons and family members, men and women. So, as you can imagine, when some magi or one wise men or these wise guys, right, from the, the Far East uh, who followed a star and rode into town looking for a king, Herod was not happy. Upon hearing the news of this newborn king, Herod feared for his throne and the people around him feared his vengeance if they didn't obey him. So once Herod learned about this information about the Messiah from the Magi, he asked them to return with the location so that he too could go and worship the king. But being warned in a dream, the Magi, after visiting Jesus, traveled home a different way. And upon finding this out, Herod, in his anger and his paranoia, decided to take matters into his own hands. And he tried to kill every Hebrew baby boy that fit the age range of the Messiah. Listen to Matthew 2.16. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious. And he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Well, do you think Herod stopped Jesus? Did, did Herod stop Jesus from rescuing you and me? From saving us by dying on Calvary's cross? Did Herod in any way derail Jesus' mission of love? I don't think so. You see, God sent an angel to warn Joseph in a dream, and he took Mary and the baby Jesus to safety in Egypt. Herod failed to stop Jesus because Jesus and his love is un... All right, go for, you're going to have to build up because we're going to do that at the end of each point, all right? Just warning, all right? So I want you to get stronger. And then don't get tired. Nine o'clock got strong, and then they really faded out. They gave out, all right? But so y'all keep up the tempo, all right? So next up we have here, number two, Satan the evil deceiver. 
Now, Satan has been an enemy of God and God's plan of love long before Jesus was born. He has been against God ever since his pride took him from the position he was kicked out of heaven. Uh, but the time that we see him try to stop Jesus and Jesus' mission of love on earth was right after Jesus' baptism and right before Jesus started his earthly ministry. You see, Satan tried his best to get Jesus to fall and to fail by tempting Jesus. Satan tried to stop Jesus' plan of love by tempting Jesus with these empty promises and bribes that he could not fulfill. He was trying to tempt Jesus into disobeying God the Father. He was trying to talk Jesus into taking the easy way out. He was basically like this. Jesus, do you really want to suffer in this life? Right? Being a human is tough as you find that out. Do you really want to die for these people? You know their hearts. Most of them are going to reject you. You know, you're building your kingdom, but if you bow down to me, I can get all the worldly people to bow down to you right now without all the sacrifice. Don't you want to take the easy way out? You see, Jesus, both fully divine and fully human, experienced temptation just as much as you and I do, the same way that we do, but he did not yield to that temptation. He did not sin. Listen to Matthew 4, 8 through 11. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan. For it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him. Can you imagine the fury that Satan felt when Jesus remained strong in his choice to choose you and me? Jesus chose love. Satan tried to stop Jesus, but Jesus is unstoppable. But the devil didn't stop now. He didn't quit. He's not a quitter. He didn't stop his evil schemes just because he couldn't stop Jesus. So since the great deceiver couldn't stop God's ultimate plan of love and redemption for you and me, he changed tactics. He, he all of a sudden decided to cause as much pain in Jesus' life as possible. Since temptation didn't work, since going after Jesus directly didn't work, maybe he could cause others to physically hurt or kill Jesus. Listen to what Satan did next. It's found in Luke 22, 3. It says, Then Satan entered Judas, called Iscariot, one of the twelve. And Judas went to the chief priests and the officers of the temple guard and discussed with them how he might betray Jesus. You see, Satan had a big part, a major part in Jesus being arrested, beaten, whipped, and hung on that cross. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us if, Jesus, or if Satan was a witness of Jesus' death. But it would be a safe assumption to say that he was. After all, wouldn't he want to witness his greatest victory? He had stopped Jesus, or so he thought. That smug smile on the devil's face would forever be turned into an agony and frown. When all of a sudden, upon Jesus' death, he realized what the scripture said and he said man in my anger what have I done his frown would have deepened especially three days later when he realized that that tomb was empty his perceived victory became his greatest defeat when Jesus conquered death and rose from the grave Satan thought he had stopped Jesus but guess what Jesus used the enemy's evil to accomplish his good plans Jesus used Satan's scheming as part of his sovereign plan Satan wanted to kill Jesus but he didn't know or he didn't remember that Jesus' plan was to be killed Satan thought that the cross would be Jesus' ultimate defeat but what he didn't know was that Jesus planned for it to be his greatest victory. Satan thought that he could win with hate. But what he didn't know was that Jesus would use that hate to propel himself to commit the greatest act of love. Dying on the cross for you and me. Satan tried his best 
to stop Jesus, to hinder the love of Christ. But Jesus is... All right, all right. Y'all are a little slow on it still, but it's getting better. All right, number three. Number three, we have the Sanhedrin, the wicked religious leaders. We can also include here the chief priests, the Pharisees, and the Sadducees. All right, so we're going to lump them all together to say this. Religion is always an enemy of Jesus. Religious folks like their rules, their traditions, and they hate anyone who tells them that they're wrong or who attempt to tell them the truth. You see, the religious folks often worship a man-made system instead of the very God that they claim to worship. And the religious Jews were no different. They had the right God, but they were going about it the wrong way. Now, the Sanhedrin was the supreme religious council of the Jewish people in the time of Christ and before. And when Jesus first came on the scene, at first they were just skeptical. Who is this man? What is he teaching? As Jesus' ministry and its influence grew, they became jealous. And as Jesus grew more and more in his influence, and as they heard more and more of the truth that Jesus preached, they became downright irate, hostile, angry. Listen to Matthew 26, 59. This is the, where the anger and jealousy and hatred for Jesus took them. It says this, the chief priest and the whole Sanhedrin was looking for false evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death. The hard-hearted religious crowd really didn't like Jesus at all. And their desire was to trap him into what they considered blasphemy. So they set their minds that they would find a way to execute this. Listen to Matthew 27, 1. Early in the morning, all the chief priests and the elders of the people made their plans how to have Jesus executed. So they bound him, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate the governor. They found their false witnesses. They had their illegal sham trials that were held in the middle of the night. And they convicted Jesus on a trumped-up charge of blasphemy. But they didn't stop there. You see, the crowds of people, the masses, didn't have a problem with Jesus. They didn't. They didn't love Jesus, but they loved the miracles that Jesus performed. They loved the healing that he brought. So they didn't want to see Jesus executed. So the religious leaders had to step in and step it up a notch. Matthew 27, 20 says this, But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus executed. You see, it was Jewish tradition to always have a Jewish prisoner released right before the feast of Passover. And the religious leaders were scared that Jesus would be the one that would be released. So they worked the crowd up into this mob mentality, into just this frenzy of, of people wanting to see blood, like, like sharks with blood in the water. And they chose to release a murderer while chanting, crucify him, crucify him, in regards to Jesus. They wanted Jesus dead, and they got what they wanted, or so they thought. You see, they wanted Jesus dead. Why? Because they wanted him to go away for good. Well, he died, but he didn't go away. And he certainly didn't stay that away or long at all. He came right back, stronger than ever. You see, they thought they had stopped Jesus. But all they did was help facilitate Jesus' plan. They thought they had power. They thought they had control, but they had no power or control as far as Jesus' life and death and resurrection went. God was, God is, and God will always be in total control. You see, the religious leaders couldn't stop Jesus. They couldn't stop his love. They couldn't stop his grace. They couldn't stop his mission. They couldn't stop his resurrection. They couldn't stop his plan to save and redeem all those who the Father had given him because Jesus is... All right, all right. Now we're going to move on, all right? This next person on the list of people who tried to stop Jesus is an interesting one, all right? This person wasn't an enemy of Jesus. He was a friend of Jesus. 
He was a follower of Jesus. Yet he, without understanding what he was doing, tried to stop Jesus and Jesus' act of love of dying for you and me. Who is this person? Here he is. Number four, Simon Peter, the misguided defender. Now, towards the end of his earthly ministry, Jesus didn't hide nothing from his disciples. He began telling his disciples what he was going to do and where he was going to go. He told them that he was going to go to Jerusalem, that he was going to suffer many things, that he was going to be killed, and that he was going to be raised on the third day. Of course, the disciples, upon hearing this news, didn't receive it well. Why? They loved Jesus. They didn't want him to die. So listen to what Peter told Jesus as recorded in Matthew 16, 22. Then Peter took Jesus aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. Picture that. Jesus teaching, telling the disciples the plan of redemption, the plan of salvation. Had a great sermon and all this. And afterwards, Peter was like, Pastor, Rabbi, I don't want to tell this in front of the guys, but man, that's not going to happen. Far be it from you. Get that thought out of your head. Are you crazy? You know, let me correct you on this. Now, let's, let's hear how say, uh, Jesus responded, all right? He said, get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me. Why? Here we go. For you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. You see, Peter loved Jesus. He didn't mean to be used at that time as instrument of the devil, but he allowed his love for Jesus, his desire for Jesus to stay with him and the rest of the disciples, his desire to keep the li his life the exact same way it was. It was wonderful. He allowed his love for Jesus and his love for his lifestyle to blind him to the truth and reality of Jesus' mission. But this isn't the only time that we see Peter being a misguided defender of Jesus. You would think after Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan, that would kind of, oh man, you know. But no, we see Peter still, mm -mm, this ain't going to happen, all right. If you know your Bible, you, you will recall that when the Roman guards and the Jews came into the garden to arrest Jesus, Peter tried to stop Jesus from being taken by the Roman guards. Listen to what happens as recorded in John 18, 10 through 11, and then Matthew 26, 53 and 54 gives us the rest. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. Now, he was aiming for his throat, right? He was aiming for his throat. The servant's name was Malchus. Jesus commanded Peter, put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? Do you think I cannot call upon my Father? And he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? But how then would the word of scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen this way? Can you imagine how hard it must have been for the disciples who loved Jesus to accept Jesus must die to fulfill his plan as Messiah. And that there was nothing they could help him do to get through it. There was nothing they could do that could stop him. They did not truly fully understand at this time why Jesus must die. Peter, in his misguided and ignorant love for Jesus, failed to protect Jesus and save him from the cross. But Jesus didn't want to be saved. He wanted to do the saving, and Jesus had to die to do that. You see, what Peter didn't understand at this time was that Jesus was not the one who needed saving. Peter was the one that needed saving. He needed saving from his own sins, yet Peter, in his ignorance, tried to stop Jesus from saving Peter and all of us. With misguided love, he tried to stop Jesus, but you can't stop Jesus because Jesus is unstoppable. Oh, y'all getting stronger, a lot better in the little nine crowd. All right. Now, I'm going to share with you one more person who tried to stop Jesus. Now, this person wasn't like Herod or Satan or the Sanhedrin. He wasn't an enemy of Jesus. 
He wasn't like Peter either, okay? He wasn't a friend of Jesus. This man was just, eh, you know, towards Jesus, all right? He was just indifferent towards Jesus. Number five, Pontius Pilate, the spineless judge. As most of you know, Pontius Pilate was the Roman governor that was in charge of, uh, of Judea at the time of Jesus' death. So in other words, he was the man who had the power to free or to execute a prisoner. He was the judge. Now, he did not like getting involved in Jewish matters, right? He just wanted to be do his Roman stuff, and he thought the Jews were beneath him. So he wanted the Sanhedrin and Jesus to figure out how to be peaceful among themselves. He just viewed the Jews and the religion beneath his status in life. But as a matter of fact, he knew Jesus was innocent. He didn't want to crucify Jesus. He viewed this as Jews, Jew, uh, Jewish business, and he didn't want to get involved with it. He wanted to stay clear out of the politics. And the fourth gospel tells us, it makes it clear that Pilate knew Jesus was innocent of any crime. And when you put all the gospel counts together, it appears that Pilate tried four times to, to intervene in a way that would avoid sentencing Jesus to death. First of all, he told the Jews to try the case themselves. John 18, 31, Pilate said, take Jesus yourselves and judge him by your own law. Then he sent the case to Herod. He found out, wait a minute, Jesus is not from Jerusalem, he's from Galilee? Awesome, Herod's in charge of Galilee and he happens to be visiting me at this time. It says this, Luke 23, 6, when he learned that Jesus was under Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who was also in Jerusalem at that time. Next, he tried to placate the Jews by having Jesus scourged and whipped instead of crucified. You see, John uh, 19, 1 through 4, or 1 and 4. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. Once more, Pilate came out and said to the Jews, gather here, look, I am bringing them out to you to let you know that I find no basis for this charge against him. He thought just a beating and turning out some blood would be enough and then he could free Jesus. But that didn't work, so he tried one more time. He tried to make a deal with the people, but the people chose Barabbas instead. Mark 15, 9 through 11. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? Asked Pilate, knowing that it was out of self-interest that the chief priest had handed Jesus over to him. But the chief priest uh, stirred up the crowd to have Pilate release Barabbas instead. So our narrative ended with this, Matthew 27. What shall I do then with Jesus, who is called the Messiah, Pilate asked. They all answered, crucify him. When Pilate saw that he was going nowhere, but that instead an uproar was starting, he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd and said, I am innocent of this man's blood, he said. It is your responsibility. He said that, but it wasn't their responsibility. It was his responsibility. You see, Pilate didn't understand Jesus. He didn't think Jesus was God in the flesh. He didn't know who Jesus truly was. He did not understand Jesus' plan to redeem us. But what he did know was that Jesus was a good and innocent man. But rather than standing up for Jesus, rather than doing the right and just thing, rather than being a righteous judge, rather than being a fair leader, he faltered to the blackmail and pressure from the high-ranking Jewish officials who were like, you know, you can't handle this, maybe somebody else from Rome could. He yielded to the mob mentality of the Jewish crowd and the people chose Jesus' fate as God had planned. Now if you think about it, Pilate's crime in many ways, his sin was worse than the Sanhedrin. Think about it. The religious leaders honestly thought in their mind and heart that Jesus was guilty they really thought they were serving God, that Jesus was a blasphemer, that they were really serving the Lord Most High and getting rid of this false prophet. They really thought that. They thought he was guilty. They wanted him dead. But Pilate, on the other hand, knew that Jesus was innocent. Yet they sent him to die anyway. 
He stalled and hesitated and tried to pass the buck. He wouldn't decide, so the mob decided for him. He was more concerned about his political career than doing the right thing. In today's world, we would say that he was scared of being canceled. So he decided to let the mob win. They wanted to cancel Jesus, and he knew if he stood up for Jesus, he would get canceled too. So he went with the flow. He waved the let's kill Jesus flag and let culture win out instead of the truth. Pontius Pilate, in an act of cowardice, sent Jesus to the cross to appease the people's demands. He went along with the crowd, but guess what? That did not stop Jesus' plan of love, because going to the cross was Jesus' plan all along. Pilate could not stop Jesus, because Jesus Christ is... Wow, there you go. All right? Y'all preached it. You know, church, as believers, we can be thankful... That Jesus did not allow any man or woman or spirit or power to stop his fathers and his plan to die on the cross and to rise from the dead. You see, God's plan of salvation could not be stopped. Jesus could not be stopped. Governments tried to stop Jesus. Satan tried to stop Jesus. Religion tried to stop Jesus. Misguided friends who thought they knew better than Jesus tried to stop him. People bowing down to popular opinion and culture tried to stop Jesus. And even death tried to stop Jesus. But they all failed miserably because Jesus Christ is unstoppable. And our unstoppable Jesus loves us with an unstoppable and unfailing love. You see, the ones who tried to stop Jesus were stopped by Jesus. Jesus is unstoppable. Do you know that, church? Do you truly believe that, church? Do you believe that Jesus is unstoppable? Do you believe that his love for you is unstoppable? If so, i got a question for you. If you believe it, have you been living like you believe it? Have you been living an unstoppable life? Have you been living a victorious life? You see, the same spirit, the same power that is inside of Jesus is inside of you. If you are in Christ, if you are abiding in Jesus, you should be unstoppable. So are you unstoppable or have you allowed your enemies to stop you? You see, the same enemies that tried to stop Jesus are still around today and they're still trying to stop him. Now listen, they can't stop what he has already done in the past. They can't stop what he is doing in the present. They can't stop what he will do in the future. But that doesn't stop them from trying to stop the good work that he is doing in you. They can't stop his love for you, but they can distract you from his love. They can deceive you into thinking that you are not loved. They can put you, put up enough temptations and idols in front of you with the hope that you will develop a love for them instead of cultivating your love for Jesus. You see, they can't stop Jesus, but they will try to stop you. So have you been slowed in maturing as a disciple of Jesus? Looking at your life, has somewhere along the way, have you stopped progressing as a Christian? Have you started backsliding into sin? Or are you faithfully following Jesus and remaining unstoppable? Today, Jesus, and therefore the bride of Jesus, the body of Jesus, the church, still has some enemies, enemies that will try to stop us. Governments and the world system will try to stop us. Satan and his evil companions will try to stop us. Religions and false teaching will try to stop us. Misguided friends with worldly advice and no godly wisdom Friends who really care about us and love about us and know about this life but know nothing about God and His plan for us will try to stop us. Our worldly culture along with the mob mentality of the masses will also try to stop us. So be honest with me. Are you caught up and trapped by the web of politics of today? Has spiritual warfare and the fiery darts of Satan got you pinned down? Have you followed some false teaching or been forced or focused on checking religious boxes that you walked into some quicksand that is now pulling you down? 
Has some bad advice or bad influence from worldly friends confused you and has stopped your forward movement after Jesus? Has the fear of being canceled or the fear of not being popular or the fear of being picked on or the enticement of the current culture or the power of the worldly majority stopped you from following after Jesus? Well, if you are struggling this morning with following after Jesus, if you are struggling with the thought that Jesus cannot love you after all you have done, after all the times you have failed to listen, after all the times you lived in disobedience, after all the years of walking in disobedience and unfaithfulness, if you have been feeling like your enemies are too strong and too many, and somehow they will defeat you and smother you and separate you from the love of Jesus, if you feel like Jesus' work on the cross is unstoppable, but somehow His work in you can be stopped, if you think that somehow it is impossible for you to live an unstoppable and victorious life, then I have a passage of Scripture just for you. Turn with me in your Bibles, if you got them, to Romans 8, 31 through 39. And listen to one of the most beautiful and encouraging and uplifting passages in the entire Bible. And if you're struggling with enemies, if you're struggling with whether you're loved or whether you're sinned one too many times, this passage is for you. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, hold on. <coughs> Man, I messed up on the greatest scripture right there. Something just, Satan just threw in my throat right there. Oh, I nearly died. All right. All right, get back into focus. What then shall we say to these things? <coughs> If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died, and furthermore, it is also risen who is even at the right hand of God, who makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all of these things we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor debt, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. This passage lets us know that Jesus is unstoppable, Jesus is undefeatable, Jesus is unconquerable. And if we belong to Jesus, then we too are unstoppable. If we belong to Jesus, there is nothing that can separate us from his love. There is no power on earth, no power in hell, no power in heaven that can separate us from the love of Jesus. There is no sin you can commit. There is no transgression that you can do. There is no evil that you can say that can separate you from the love of Jesus. There is nothing that you will face. There, there is nothing that you will endure. There is nothing that you will go through that can separate you from the love of Jesus Christ. There is nothing in creation. There is nothing in this life or the next life that can separate Jesus from his bride. And that is because Jesus Christ is unstoppable. Jesus' love is unstoppable. Jesus' passion for you and me is unstoppable. And I want you to know that if you are one of Jesus's, then you are unstoppable too. Nothing can separate you from the love of Jesus. Nothing can stop Jesus' plans for your life. Jesus is passionately in love with you and there is nothing that can stop him from loving you. There is nothing that can separate him from you. There is nothing that can stop his beautiful plan for you. There is nothing that can take away your salvation. There is nothing that can take away your inheritance. There is nothing that can take away your destiny in Christ Jesus. And because Jesus is unstoppable, 
That means if you belong to Jesus, you are unstoppable too. You can live a victorious life, and that is because Jesus loves you. Jesus is passionately in love with you, and he loves you with a humble, perfect, and unstoppable love. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for your unstoppable love. We thank you, Lord, that nothing Satan can do, nothing the world can do, nothing that we can do that can open your hands and snatch us out of it. Father, that is wonderful to thank. That is wonderful to know that nothing can separate us from your love. That you are the author of our salvation. And what you have started, you will complete. What you began, you will finish. So, Father, we thank you for that encouragement. We thank you for that truth. And I pray that you work in the people in these rooms. Give them encouragement to know that if they are yours, that if they are part of the bride, that if they are saved, then they can live the victorious life. So, Father, just continue to speak in their hearts. Speak to the hearts of those who perhaps don't know you, have not lived in the victorious life, who are not living a transformed life. They, they have the facts and they say to believe, but honestly, it, it hasn't led to nothing. It hasn't changed them. It hasn't transformed them. Father, help them to surrender and give you their heart and make them new. Father, just speak to us in this room and call us to respond however we need to respond. Let us give, us, uh, give you our heart. In your son's name I pray. Amen.